You're listening to the Bill Kelly Podcast. Here's your host, Bill Kelly. Welcome to another edition of the Bill Kelly Podcast, critical discussions in critical times. And we are indeed, as we broadcast today, in critical times. Uh, it's war in the Middle East right now uh, with Hamas and the state of Israel, of course, because of what's happened this past weekend. And uh, as in all eyes, of course, on Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and Gaza, uh, all eyes still are on Washington, too, to see what the U.S. reaction is going to be and what, uh, if anything, they are going to be doing with this militarily, uh, financially, etc. Uh, to get some insight into this, we're so pleased to welcome to the program Reggie Cicchini. Reggie, of course, is the Washington correspondent for Global News in the U.S. Capitol. Uh, Reggie, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Really appreciate the time on what I know it's going to be a very busy day for you. Thank you for having me. Let's let's talk about what you what you've been able to ascertain so far. As I've been watching some of the morning news there. Uh, there are protests right across the United States, pro-Palestinian protests, pro-Israeli protests, uh, some clashes between those two factions. Um, how is this playing out in Washington right now? And, and, and I want to get your insight into what's going on uh, from a political standpoint, especially because they all seem to be saying the right things. But uh, how is that resonating with the public and how is it resonating in Congress? Well, I mean, look, those are those are big questions um, on the public side. Look, America is obviously weary. Uh, you know, polling obviously hasn't been done as of yet. But from, you know, the general consensus, from conversations that have been had, um, there is a, there is there is a there's a fear amongst Americans that America could find itself now being involved in not only another war in the Middle East, but another war on top of its involvement with the war that's already underway in Ukraine, uh, between Ukraine and Russia. So there's a general concern here amongst the American public as to what's going to have next. But at the same time, this is a country that stands uh, solidly beside, at least from a political standpoint, solidly beside uh, Israel. And we've heard from members of the House, we have heard right up to uh, the inner parts of the White House, uh, that there is no intention to step away or back away uh, from its longstanding support uh, of Israel. Uh, and, you know, the question here is, look, America is dealing with strife when it comes to its own domestic politics. How is that now going to play into or factor into what America does next when it comes to assisting Israel? And and that seems to be one of the, uh, I guess, subplots here, but a major one nonetheless, isn't it, Reggie? Uh, Politically, this couldn't have come at a worse time. The, the the Congress is in disarray right now. The Republican Party, which controls Congress, is in disarray. They don't have a speaker. Uh, that may probably be settled later on this week. But but how how crippled are they right now? Because they seem to not have their act together. And the the, the circumstances in the Middle East right now dictate that something has to be done now. Absolutely, and nothing can be done now. You're right. There's disarray. Uh, on the Republican side uh, of politics here. Uh, and it's the fact that there is a vacant speakership position in the House of Representatives that has essentially paralyzed the U.S. government. Without a speaker in place, legislation can't be brought to the floor for a vote. And if legislation can't be brought to the floor for a vote, that means that potential emergency legislation, like trying to appropriate money uh, towards Israel, uh, it, it essentially can't happen. At the same time, you have... Um, uh, classified briefings that are to take place between the gang of eight with leadership members within Congress. It's a leader. It's it's a group of seven right now because there is no uh, speaker of the house. There's an interim. There's an acting speaker who doesn't get these classified briefings. He gets the declassified or the unclassified briefing. So there's a there's an immediate stoppage of the flow of money. There's an immediate stoppage of the flow of information. And at the same time, on the Senate side, you have one Republican who's holding up. Uh, confirmations for things like uh, 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 the confirmed positions for CENTCOM in the Middle East. So now you have this posturing, this this maneuvering of of warships and munitions and and additional military infrastructure and hardware into the waters off Israel, and there is nobody technically leading this charge because again, politics in the United States is playing a significant role here, which again raises that question. How is that going to impact whatever the U.S. is trying to do to assist Israel? Now, that was kind of off on the side, you know, stage left for the longest time, but it's really come into the, the fore now, hasn't it, Reggie? The fact that there's a huge turmoil and a turnover at the Pentagon these days. You know, we know that Milley has left, but so has his team. And, and as you say, there's one senator right now that's basically blocking these appointments. Uh, how much pressure is that putting on the White House right now to act unilaterally, which is only going to cause the, uh, the ire, I guess, of the Republicans in the House and the Senate? 
Well, I mean, look, the, the president of the weekend said, number one, you know, called these attacks unconscionable, saying that the United States is going to do what it can to stand with Israel. At the same time, he doesn't have anyone to work with in the House. He has Republicans who are against him. He has Republicans, he even has some Democrats who oftentimes are pushing back on his policy mm -hmm. uh, policies and his kind of foreign agenda. But he doesn't have a House speaker to work with. Still, the president's doing what he can. He's using the, uh, the officials within his cabinet to be able to take the next steps. We've seen that the Pentagon has announced that airships and that uh, missile carriers and that an increased aircraft presence with, uh, with F-15s and 16s and 35s and A-10s, these are all going to be brought into the region. They are a show. They are a show of support from the United States to push back on what could come from Iran, what could come from Lebanon. So the president may not have everybody in line in D.C., but he is using the powers and the authority that he has to be able to make good on these promises. During one of the many interviews that uh, that Anthony Blinken gave over the weekend, uh, he was on all the Sunday shows, of course, uh, he said that we got caught off guard, uh, which is, I guess is a massive understatement. Uh, how does this happen? I mean, we know about the, the, the intelligence gathering that's going on on a, on a regular basis, Reggie. Uh, the five eyes, of course, but the five eyes are really the two major players there in the United States. And, and, and in this particular case in the Middle East, Israel, uh, who we thought uh, you know, was, was one of the preeminent intelligence gathering uh, agencies in the world. Uh, everybody got caught off guard here. What happened? I mean, that's that's one of the questions I'm sure that the Congress and the Senate are going to have to deal with here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, Israel, number one, had a reputation for being almost invincible. And here is Israel now under full attack and has been for the last three days. And you have questions over intelligence. How did Israel not catch this? How did the United States not catch this? Or how did an ally of either country not catch any of this? Uh, and, you know, there have been members of Congress who have been pushing back to say, look, I think that we can pin some of this blame on Tehran, trying to say that Iran is backing this, even though the president of Iran came out over the weekend, said, look, congratulations on the victory to the Palestinians, but you have officials in Iran saying, look, we're not connected to this. We don't have anything to do with it. And even the Secretary of State and, and, and high officials in the administration are not saying that there's a smoking gun here, that that Iran is the one who's 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 backing Hamas, despite precedent being in place to show that Iran often does stand behind um, Hamas. The, the questions are, how did the intelligence fail so badly? And what can be done about that? Or what are the ramifications going to be? Look, there are Americans that are caught up in this. There are Canadians that are caught up in this. And this failure in intelligence is going to be felt far outside uh, of the borders uh, of Israel. But it's still very early. There's a, still a lot that 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 leaders, that governments don't know. And I think that that unknown is causing some of that concern because they don't know where this is going to go. They don't know how long this is going to last. Well, some people are suggesting, uh, postulating, actually, that this was phase one this past weekend. And that's a pretty scary proposition, uh, because now, of course, you've got Hezbollah with some action in the northern part of Israel right now. Uh, is this a, a coordinated effort by, by by two agencies that have similar goals, i.e. the destruction of Israel? Uh, and, and it seems as if there's a strategy that could be evolving out of this whole thing, which I guess really just kind of underscores just uh, what a failure the intelligence agencies were, because this didn't happen overnight, Reggie. I mean, you know, what evidence we have so far is that this was a very planned uh, strategic attack. That takes months sometimes to organize something like this with all these factors. Sure. And that's where some of the conversation is surrounding Iran by saying, look, Hamas may not have likely doesn't have the ability to carry out such a coordinated attack in one night to be able to launch thousands of missiles towards uh, Israel. This is not something that was kind of drawn on the back of a napkin um, and carried out. Raising the question here, is somebody from within Lebanon? Is somebody from within Iran? Is Iran pressuring Syria to now get involved in this. There's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of, of questions as to how far um, this is going to go and who ultimately is going to be the backer and the reasons for it. Look, there are there are numerous reasons. This is not the first time Israel and Hamas have found themselves, um, you know, butting heads with each other. Obviously, this is the most um, significant in, 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 in kind of recent history here. Um, but at the same time, there were other issues that were playing out regionally, including this United States push to have Israel and Saudi Arabia uh, make friends with each other to, 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 cr to create this new connection, something that is obviously upsetting for uh, for the Arab world. So is there a risk here that this was done as a way to kind of derail 
what countries like Iran did not want to see, which were normalized relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia, a key pillar from the foreign policy agenda mm -hmm. for President Biden. The other element to this, too, is is what's happening since then. Uh, we know that, uh, well, essentially, the Israeli uh, government and, and the army has, has simply decided this is war uh, and uh, against Hamas. But uh, the Palestinians in Gaza are going to be the victims here. We've already seen a number of casualties uh, as a result of some of the bombings. They say there's going to be a full force military action in there, too. Uh, is the U.S. government prepared for the pushback that they're going to get on this? Uh, we've already seen some pro-Palestinian uh, 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 demonstrations in New York, Washington, and other cities like that. Uh, when when the president allies himself as strongly to Israel as, as Biden did with Netanyahu and the phone calls they made over the weekend, uh, they've got to know that, that, that they're also going to be included in some of the criticisms uh, about how Israelis uh, respond to this. Uh, we, we know that there's a Netanyahu himself, of course, is an extreme uh, right wing conservative politician. Uh, there's going to be an awful lot of pressure for them to simply say, OK, go in there and wipe these guys out once and for all. Um, that's a, a, a strategy, if in fact they're going to adopt that, uh, that's, that's not going to be popular in North America, not going to be popular globally for that matter, too. How much sway does the Biden administration have? with Netanyahu as to how they're going to approach this. Well, I mean, look, the, the president, uh, President Biden has already made it clear to Netanyahu. These, these are longstanding allies. They are long. They, they have a longstanding friendship. But at the same time, in conversations, you know, even up to and including at the United Nations General Assembly in September, uh, President Biden made it clear um, that that the White House, that the administration does not want to see Israel do anything to provoke or, or push forward with settlements. And that is potentially going to factor into this. Look, the United States does not want to see a death toll rise beyond where it is right now. And the president is likely going to take some kind of pushback here uh, if, you know, if, if an all out ground assault were to take place in Gaza or if this were to spill over and, and fall uh, into the West Bank. Sure, there is going to be some some pushback here. But at the same time, the president has a fine line to walk because the United States uh, uh, sees Hamas as a terrorist organization, and they don't want to be found flat-footed um, and seen in a position of, of of backing or bolstering or showing some kind of sympathy for a group uh, who the who the U.S. sees as an enemy. But at the same time, you're right. The, the, at the end of the day, the victims here are going to be uh, the people, the, the elderly residents, the children uh, from within uh, from within Gaza, and we've already seen. Um, an increase in the death toll just over the last 24 hours and hearing from Israeli officials that this is going to be an all out siege, that they're going to shut off um, the supply of electricity and the supplies of, of the necessities of life. This is something Israel says they need to do to protect their own sovereignty. At the same time, it's going to spark a global reaction, whether or not it's a condemnation or, or a, vo a voice or an echo of concern here, that at the end of the day, while they're trying to fight back against a terrorist organization, there are people who are finding themselves held hostage by who are their governing leaders uh, in that state. So this is a delicate balance for not just the White House, but for all Western nations. Well, let's throw the other wild card in. And you talked about this at the beginning of our conversation. There are hostages here. And we know some of them are American. We know some of the fat fatalities were American and Canadian, for that matter. Uh, how do you intercede in something like that? I, I mean, there's got to be negotiations going on uh, with the U.S. government. Uh, do they deal with Hamas directly? Is there going to be a third party here? What 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 the strategy look like? I think that there's a lot of questions here as to how the hostage situation is going to be dealt with. What what foreign ministries and State Department officials from Canada, the U.S. and elsewhere are going to do to step in to ensure that they can protect and save um, members of their own countries here. But at the same time, um, you know, it when you go back, you know, about 10 years or, or more than 10 years, um, the question becomes, what is Israel going to do? Look, to get an Israeli defense member out of a hostage situation a number of years ago, Israel had to give up something 100, 200 Palestinians for one person. Well, there's now hundreds of people that may potentially be hostages mm -hmm. here. What does Israel find itself now having to do? And what is it going to do in conjunction with or in coordination with other nations? We understand that there have been conversations at the highest levels from the State Department and elsewhere around the world with um, Israeli counterparts to ensure that that things are being done in a coordinated effort here. But again, things are chaotic. We're, there are reports from just late Monday morning that Hamas has taken additional hostages here, and that is likely going to um, throw a, a, another curveball into this, this effort because the effort right now is, is being hindered by the fact that 
there are continued strikes that are taking place across Gaza. Do some of those strikes interfere with um, where the hostages are? Information is not flowing freely. And because of that, it's more difficult for countries to try and step in to say, look, here's what we need to do when we don't know what it is that we need to do. The world, as we mentioned, is going to be looking to the United States here for for guidance on this. And and Biden, the administration, and Republicans, for that matter, too, have all said the right things or tweeted the right things, I guess, at least so far. But talk to us about fatigue, Reggie. And you mentioned this a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about what was going on in Ukraine. Uh, let's face it. I mean, the reality is, is that support for the, the U.S. effort with the Ukrainians is wavering. It has over the last couple of months. Uh, the last thing they want is another war and another conflict. And that's that's not to gloss over the terrible human cost that's going on here. But from a political standpoint, uh, with an election coming up next year and people worried about their re-election, uh, and, you know, are we spending money on another effort, or opening up another front globally uh, when we still have domestic problems? Is there a willingness to be steadfast in this support for Israel and at the same time for Ukraine? Or are we going to see a, a sea change in attitude here? I mean, look, this is a difficult position for for President Biden, for many Republicans, for many Democrats, for many lawmakers to be standing in right now. This is this is a difficult situation for um, for the president who is up for reelection, who is not popular amongst um, a vast and growing part of the Democratic base, who is an ongoing target uh, for the Republicans here. What the president chooses to do next could ultimately factor into what decisions are made when people walk into the voting booths, not only next year, but also when it comes time uh, for primary season. Look, the, the president has taken significant criticisms for what the United States is doing when it comes to assisting uh, with Ukraine for the money, for the munitions, uh, for the time and energy spent. Israel is a different story than Ukraine is. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we have to wait to see, is the United States actively going to get involved in this somehow? Still have to wait and find that out. But But there is a you're right, there is a fatigue amongst Americans for uh, America's involvement in war. This is something that has been going on for decades. It has obviously been exacerbated over the last two years with Ukraine. So again, there's fear over what the United States may do. There's also a fear when it comes to just how it's perceived by the general public. Look, the United States has spent more than $100 billion on Ukraine. Uh, it gives Israel $3 billion a year from an agreement that was put in place under the Obama administration uh, to the tune of something like 38 or $39 billion. So again, these are dollars that are being spent overseas, not in America. America will say, look, it's for our interests that are overseas. But for the average voter, it becomes a question of, look, things are too expensive here. Where is the money that could mm -hmm. be spent in America to help us here? It's a, it's a, it's a tough spot for the president to be walking in right now as he tries to ensure that interests at home and abroad are being met with an equal look. It's a, a multifaceted dilemma right now and a very fluid situation as well. Reggie, it's always a pleasure to, to check in with you and see how things are going in the U.S. Capitol. Thank you so much for this today. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Reggie Cicchini, uh, Global News correspondent in the American Capitol. And uh, that is it for this edition of the Bill Kelly Podcast, Critical Discussions for Critical Times. Uh, if you enjoy the podcast, we hope you have. Uh, by the way, spread the word. We're available wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, I'm Bill Kelly. Take care. This podcast was brought to you by Rebecca Wizens and her team at Wizens Law. Rebecca Wizens is a 20-time winner of the Hamilton Reader's Choice Awards for their exceptional client care and legal practice specializing in personal injury, car accidents, accidental falls, and Wilson Estates. Now, if you or a loved one have been seriously injured, or if you want to make sure that your family is taken care of for the future with a will and powers of attorney, call Rebecca Wizens, 905-522-1102 for a free consultation. When life happens, you can rely on Rebecca Wizens and Wizens Law. And trust me, Rebecca is my wife, and I don't know what I'd do without her. That's Wizens Law, 905-522-1102 for a free consultation. Subscribe to my Substack for timely news updates and commentary straight to your inbox. Let's keep the conversation going. I'd love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. Let me know what you think we should be talking about next by contacting me through my website at www.billkelly.co. Thanks for tuning in. This is Bill Kelly. Till next time, you take care. Thank you.